Hi, remember we've been talking about the three perspectives in psychology on each one of these tapes, the biological, intrapsychic, and social behavioral. Today we're going to talk about the biological basis of behavior with a rather startling example, to say the least. Uh, there's a doctor, an MD, that's a neurologist, who teaches at San Diego State University and works at local hospitals in San Diego, that uh, is uh, Dr. Ramachandra, uh, a fascinating character. And one day he had a... Uh, new patient come in. And this patient had had his leg amputated by another surgeon. And uh, then, of course, he was transferred to a neurologist for follow-up treatment and rehabilitation and things like that. And Ramachandra was very used to this sort of thing. And this, this article, by the way, comes out of Ramachandra's book uh, called uh, uh, Phantoms in the Brain. And it's a fascinating book to read. I mean, it actually reads like a novel, and yet it's really a, a medical, scientific, psychological investigation. And Ramachandra had this guy come in and he said, you know, Doc, you know, I'm glad to meet you, but I've got some real problems I've got to talk to you about. He says, what do you, what do you mean? He says, I keep feeling pain in my leg that's been amputated. My left leg that got cut off, it's not there, but I can feel pain in it. And Doc said, well, you know, that's, that's not unusual. Uh, it's called the phantom limb phenomena. And uh, you still will have uh, stimulation of the brain and where the just because the leg was cut off, you know, that part of the brain wasn't cut out, so you might still feel some feelings like that. There are distraction techniques we can use. We can teach you how to deal with that. You'll get used to it after a while. And, and the guy said, they're kind of blushing. He's getting red. He goes, Doc, that's not it. There's more to it. And he says, what are you talking about? He says, I'm so embarrassed to tell you. I don't know you this, but I don't know this well, but my God, my orgasms. He says, yeah. He says, they're 10 times more powerful than they ever were before I got my leg cut off. And I feel them in my left foot. He says, am I going nuts, Doc? And Ramachandra kind of stopped for a moment and says, thought to himself, God, maybe. <laughs> Never heard of this before. Let's try to figure out what's going on. It's like a scientific detective uh, work that he's coming up with here. And he got to thinking, you know, well, the phantom limb phenomena occurs, as I mentioned, because the leg is cut off, but the receptor areas for the incoming sensations in the somatosensory cortex are still there. So, are the, uh, so let's take a look at what that, that means. That's spelled somatosensory cortex. Somatosensory cortex. And where it is located is right about here in your brain. It goes over into the central fissure that divides the left brain and the right brain. It goes down into that cleavage. And along that line, let's uh, see if we can focus in on, on these in general first. You can see on the left, we have that left one up there. You can see on the left, this is the motor cortex. And you can see that's the output of what controls, for example, the tongue, the, the jaw, the lips, the face the hand, the arm, elbows, knee, all the way down to the feet, and it wraps around. Literally that much space is devoted to the face. Very little space is devoted to the back, for example. And that makes a lot of sense, because we're creatures who have a great deal of motor things going out of our face. We control our lips and facial expressions. It's very important in our social communication of, of our needs and understanding other people's needs. But let's focus in on this one on the right. The first one was the motor cortex. This is the somatosensory cortex. And when Dr. Ramachandra was trying to figure this out, what he did is he found that if you look at the somatosensory cortex, here you've got on this side the inside of the abdomen, the pharynx, the tongue. I don't know if you can see this or not, but how much space is devoted. Again, look how much space from here to here is devoted to the face lips, nose, these are all incredibly part of what makes us human. Then you've got the thumb, the fingers, the arm, the hips, very little devoted to the hips, the leg, and it goes down and here's the toes. Can you see that where it goes right down to the toes? Well, look what's right next to the toes. Oddly enough, right next to the toes are the incoming sensory areas for the genitals. So you've got toes right here, You've got genitals right here. And that's rather surprising, rather shocking. And so Jerome Shandong started thinking, my God, what in the world could explain all this? And started figuring out that if you remember the section from the dendrites in the book, 
the structure of the neuron, that the neuron has a cell body. It has uh, dendrites that come out this way to pick up information from other neurons. And it's got an axon down here. So this part here is the axon. This is the cell body. And these are the dendrites. Dendrites make connections with other axons. Axons make connections with other dendrites. So as we learn things and our learning gets more complex, we're really increasing not the number of neurons in the brain. In fact, they're probably decreasing as we age. What we're increasing is the number of neural connections. So the more we read, the more we think, the more we talk, the more we play word puzzle games, the more connections we're building in that brain. And uh, so the dendrites increase in number and connections. And they may connect with all kinds of other, other neurons. So what he concluded was that the toes and the genitals were right next to each other on the strip down inside the central fissure of the brain. This is where the other side of the brain would come, come together here, rather this would be the other side of the brain over here. And then he concluded that since the toes were not, and the toes and feet were not being used, that area wasn't being used because there wasn't input coming in, that the dendrites, these things, grew from the genital area into the toe area. And so now he's feeling, these are incoming sensations, so now he's feeling sensations that have to do with sexuality in an area where he used to have a foot. Damnedest thing. Now stop and think for just a moment. In culture after culture around the world, we have found a certain percentage of the population who seem to be sexually aroused by feet. The Chinese have all kinds of stuff about stimulating different parts of the feet for cures and various things, but specifically some things about stimulating certain parts of the feet for sexual arousal. And in our own country, of course, we have some people who have foot fetishes. Psychologists have always written this off as kind of a, an odd obsession and so forth. But now, Ramachandran says, you know, maybe these foot fetishes really are the result of the close or the proximity of the genital somatosensory area to the foot and toe area. Maybe it's simply overlapping neurons in this that create so many people who are attracted to the feet, like feet massages for arousals, etc. And oddly enough, just before I was shooting today, on TV this morning, uh, the morning show, they <laughs> showed a series of sexual enhancement mechanisms, and one of them is this TENS unit, which is an electric stimulation unit usually used in the back, you know, where they put uh, electrodes for them on the back and then it reduces the feelings of pain that are shot to the brain when someone's having severe back problems. They've now developed an electric TENS unit that anecdotally has been tested. It hasn't been tested scientifically yet, but anecdotally they put it on the ankles in a certain spot that stimulates the nerves, particularly for women, that uh, enhance uh, the electrical stimulation of, of the clitoris. So our body is fascinating. So now here's an example of a biological aspect of psychology. In the old days, Freud would have had some great explanation that was deep and psychological and why his mother treated him wrong and all this crap. And the reality, of course, take that word crap back because Freud had lots of good ideas and some rather odd ones too. But the reality is, is that some of these things can be physiologically explained. Thanks. <laughs>